For those of us that remain in the room, we're going to dig into God's Word as well. Uh, we're going to be in the second uh, letter to the church in Corinth, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're going to begin in verse 16 and then read on just to the, to the beginning of, of chapter 6. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn with me there. If not, the words will be on the screen as we dig into God's Word together. Again, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16 and following. Now let's together hear the word of the Lord. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. He has committed to us the message of reconciliation, and we are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him, that is Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God. As God's co-workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. This is God's word offered to us in its reading and in its hearing, so we give thanks to the Lord God Almighty. Uh, bow with me for a word of prayer, please. Gracious and loving God, let the power of your word wash over us. Let the presence of your Holy Spirit meet with us. Open our eyes that we would see, our ears that we would hear. Open our minds that we would come to know and understand your word, our hearts that we would feel its power then I ask, O oh God, that you would open our hands, that in response we would offer grace to the world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. It's amazing how over the course of uh, a lifetime, uh, our perspectives and points of view shift and change uh, so often, so many times, over and over again, it seems, this last summer in July, our family took a, a COVID vacation, right? We, we decided that we were going to go kind of on these hikes and excursions and adventures out in Utah and southwestern Colorado and New Mexico. We were going to do some things that were like, you know, when your Amazon Alexa is like showing you all the different pictures of like the world's majesty, we went to like half of those, right? And that was part of just the plan. It was my dad, Lauren and I, our three kids, including Sam, and our bigs both had a friend. So four teenagers, Sam, Lauren and I, my dad. And one of the things that we decided we were going to do is we were going to go uh, on a hike uh, up to Ice Lake, which is just outside of Silverton in southwestern Colorado. We started in Aztec that morning in New Mexico, drove up to Silverton, uh, began the trail to the Ice Lake uh, around 9,000 feet, and then we, we take the climb up just over 12,000 feet to Ice Lake. Now, Ice Lake, it's like... It's, it's just majestic and like blue crystal water and mountain drop background with snow up there and, and it's just glorious. But this was like the first big hike that we had taken on this trip. So we're still acclimating to, you know, the hiking and the elevation and all the like. And so my dad's there with, with me and we, we decide, all right, we're going to start out on this trip, but it's COVID land. And so my dad had his mask on and at the time, 69 years old, began the, the, the hike with his mask on about like mm, two, 300 yards up the mountain, uh, you know, early elevation climb. He just started like making himself toxic and he was having a lot of trouble breathing. So he's like, all right, I can't do this mask thing. It's not going to work. Uh, elevation, I need my oxygen. But the rest of the hike, he was not the same. 
Did I mention we had just started two or 300 yards up and he's already struggling? Not to mention I had my whole crew, including my eight-year-old with me. And so from that point on, it was, it was a trek. We were a couple miles up and there's this magnificent waterfall just, just streaming down the mountain. And, uh, and it's just glorious. And Lauren is like, this was my carrot. This is all I needed to see. Like, this is fantastic. I, I love this. And so she's like, deuces, I'm out. Uh, I got my waterfall. Y'all can do the rest. And I'm like, who else wants to go? Sam, do you want to go with mom back down? And he said, no. <laughs> I'm like, dad, hey, dad, do you, you know, you got your waterfall. Do you want to go too? You know, you're struggling. You're having to stop. No, nope. don't, don't want to go back down. I'm heading up. And so the, the entire rest of the way up, you know, we were pretty bonded on the way to, to the waterfall, but then on the rest of the way up, it's starting to be a real struggle. You know, I have Aiden and Addie and their friends, like they're the rabbit out in front, and I got my dad and Sam that I'm dragging along as the caboose, and we're just, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to hold this tension, keep it together. And I tell the bigs, I'm like, every time you look back and you can't see, you stop, right? If you can't see me, you stop. And then we'll come back together, and then I'll release you, and we'll just do this thing all the way up the mountain. That's what we decided we were doing. So we, we get to the point where it starts to get bare. You know, we're above the tree line, and you could see all the switchbacks. Boom, 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 boom. And you're like, oh. But you see all the switchbacks, and then you see the flat, and they tell us on the way down, they're like, you know, the hikers that are coming down, they're like, that's it. And it's worth it. You got to get there. So we stop. We eat some boiled eggs. We get some, some, some nuts and some raisins. We're like getting all fueled up and we're like, take the mountain. Here we go. And I release the bigs. I'm like, gone. And I'm like, all right, dad, here's the deal. I'm gonna go with Sam and I'm gonna go at Sam's pace, but I gotta get Sam up this mountain too. Because I'm gonna be able to see you the whole way, I'm gonna go up and so whenever you get there, it's gonna be great. So we just divide and conquer. Bigs, me and Sam, my dad. So the bigs get up there, and they're, uh, they're having some fun. It's like icy, snowy stuff that they're throwing at each other, right? At the lake, it's, it's beautiful, but freezing cold. They're like getting in just a little bit, as much as they could tolerate. Some of them just a little foot. Some of them try to go to their waist. Bad idea. I don't know why they did that. Stupid happens. Okay, so, um, <laughs> so Sam and I get up there, and, uh, and we get to the top, and he's starting to enjoy himself. We're relaxed, and I get my feet in because, you know, we just hiked up the mountain. Feet in. Feels good. You know, get a little, get a little ice bath going. And so then I start to worry because it's been about 30 minutes. I hadn't seen my dad yet. And I'm watching the kids play, but I begin focusing my attention back to the top of the, the switchbacks to see him come over the horizon, and it's not happening. So I move a little bit closer to where those switchbacks are, and I stand on top of the boulder, and I just watch and wait, and anxiousness is rising up in me as I'm wondering where my dad is. Finally, after, after what seemed like forever, he comes over the crest, and I see him, and he sees me, and he waves, and he, he just collapses down to the ground, straight to his back, and he's just laying there. And I think my dad is dead. We're on the top of this mountain. We've got no signal, no way to contact anybody. This is the end. This is the way it's over. And I just beeline, sprint to my dad 300 yards out. I sprint, and the whole way there, like, eyes are starting to water. Like, I feel the tears coming on, like, weight within my soul. And I, like, just run, just slide on my knees up next to him. And I'm like, Dad, are you okay? Are you okay? He's like, yeah, that was great. I just needed to rest a little while. <laughs> I thought my dad was dead on a mountain. From my point of view, my dad died. I was there. I watched him die. I was just going to check the pulse and know that I was defeated. From his perspective, he saw me. He knew he arrived. It was a great time to rest. <laughs> he laid down on his backpack, set it underneath his head, and just was like, oh, yeah, this is great. I'm here. 
<sighs> Every time he and I talk about this hike, he has to apologize profusely. I'm so sorry that you thought I died. I should not have done that. You're right, you shouldn't have done that. That was awful. But then, then here's, here's the deal. I totally missed this. I don't know how I missed this, but I missed this. I was telling this story to some friends recently, and, and my friends were like, this is the joy of life. Here's the deal. What your dad did to you, someday you get to do to your kids. <laughs> and I started to think about it. That's how life works, right? Your parents, like, clean your room. No, I don't want to clean. Yes, you will. And I've done that now. Like, my dad used to do that to me. Now I do it to my kids, right? I, like, that, that's part of life. And so I've been thinking, when am I going to do that? Aiden and I are going to be out somewhere. We're going to be hiking somewhere. I'm just going to, like, collapse. Like, oh. And he's going to be thinking I'm dead. <laughs> now, if I'm really dead, that's going to be a mess. Because <laughs> he's back there in the booth, and he's like, you ain't going to fool me, Dad. <laughs> you know, the, the points of view, the perspectives change. You know, you think one thing, but it's really something else. And if we could just align ourselves to a proper point of view, we might have a drastically different perspective. And that's exactly what Paul's inviting us to today. Paul is reaching out to the church in Corinth and he's giving a message for the disciples, a message for you and for me. And he knows that he is challenging two perspectives that we have and hold fast to, and he is breaking them down and reorienting our perspective into God's perspective on things. So I'm, I'm going to read verse 18. 18 is where Paul states both of these two transforming perspectives. Verse 19, he, he lays out the, the details of the first. Verse 20 lays out the details of the second. And so if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in those three verses for a, a few minutes as we uh, dig into what these two transformations are. Verse 18, it says this, all this, this new creation, this new point of view, this, this new way of being is from God, who, number one, reconciled us to himself through Christ, reconciled himself to us through Christ. And number two, he gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ. So, so there, there are these two things. The first is a message that through Christ, you are a new creation reconciled to God. Now, now there's, there's this conflict within us that raises up because we have adopted from the moment that we are confronted with the truth of our fallenness with an identity of sinner. And when we talk about it, you know, the, the church is a place for sinners, yes. Uh, but, but is your identity sinner? So many of us carry the weight and burden of that and, and believe that because we continue to struggle in sin and wrestle with temptation and sin, that, that we, are, uh, we are inherently sinner. That's our name. But God gives us a new name, Reconciled. And here's this thing that there's us and God and there's this vast chasm that lies between this chasm of sin that leads to death. And it began all the way at the beginning. Adam and Eve in the garden, this original sin. And it continues forward. And when we read the scripture, we hear over and over again this historic witness of how we are constantly confronted with our sinful nature as humans but then in Christ, a new thing happens. You are no longer sinner. You are reconciled. Now, please bear with me. I didn't say you no longer sin. I said you are no longer sinner. That is not your name any longer. You are reconciled. 
that chasm no longer has power or potency over you and me because Christ has built the bridge from sin to salvation. The distance has been met and now we are one with God in Christ. Here's what it looks like. Verse 19 breaks that down a little further. God, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ. This is God's action and he's bringing the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. God knows your sin, but when you receive the salvation of Christ, he's not any longer counting them against you, but you are counted as forgiven, as grace-impacted, reconciled people. And he could He would be justified in counting our sin against us. But he did not want to leave this chasm between us any longer through Christ. He brought us together and made us one with him. We are now reconciled people. You might be thinking, yeah, that's like, like that's my wife or that's my husband or that's my mom or uh, I, I see that in, in my kid, or I see that in some other person that gets it. I see that in the, in the guy that I work with, or, 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 or the woman that I golf with, or, or there's, there, I, I see this reconciled identity in someone else, and I look to that, and I point to that, and I, and I wish for that, but I don't have that. That's not me. That's someone else. Paul is really clear on this. He does not mince words. He does not say that this gift of Christ, this gift of reconciliation is for some. He says it's for the world. Did you hear that in verse 19? It's the world. Everyone. This reconciled nature is yours in Christ if you but receive it. And it frees you from the bondage of slavery to sin. And now at liberty, we walk as new creation. I pray that no matter how difficult or challenging it is to to have that transforming shift of perspective, I pray that that will be yours today because it will bring liberty and peace in tremendous measure. Here's the second thing that that, that Paul uh, reorients us on, changes our point of view on. He says, the end of verse 18, and gave us the ministry of reconciliation gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That would make us ministers. Now that might be a really like crazy thing to walk through, right? Because you've all driven past the church uh, that has a little sign out front And it says, you know, such and such church minister and then gives a name uh, of some typically older dude. Uh, And so you, you have an association of what that looks like. And what you know is that ain't you. That sign hasn't had your name on it. But Paul just gave you a name. He said, you're a minister. A minister of the gospel. He didn't say you're a bench warmer. He didn't say you're on the sidelines. He didn't say uh, you're waiting for your turn or someday or somehow. He said now you're a minister of the gospel. And, And get this, more than that, he says you're qualified for this. You are credentialed for it. You have everything you need to be a minister of the gospel. Here's what you need. If you have received grace, then to offer grace is simple. You're just testifying to what you already know. Paul says it in another way here. He says uh, at the end of 19, opening 20, he says, And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. 
I see it on your faces. I love it. You are ministers. This is like awesome. <laughs> Y'all are like, what? This is not something that you outsource to someone else. This is not what your tithes and offering pay for someone else to do. Right? This is something that we all do. We're all ministers, and here's how it works. You see, you receive the gift of salvation, and it so potently moves in your life that you can do nothing but go and tell someone else about it. Like, you can't but offer grace to the world as well. You know, every time I draw to a conclusion of a prayer before I preach, I say, and Lord, open our hands that we would offer grace to the world. This is not a tight-fisted existence we have. And so you and I have to shift our perspective that this is not about someone else's role, but this is about my role as a minister of the gospel. We continued on when we read all the way through chapter 6, verse 1. And uh, it, it uses a, a fresh uh, wind of language to, to offer a, a redress of the subject. He says, as God's co-workers, you're, you're God's co-workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. Let that sink in. For a few beats. It is possible for us to receive God's grace in vain. How? If we receive God's grace and never offer it to anyone else. How sad is that? But you and I have a changed role, a new perspective on life. We don't enter into Christian community and fellowship so that we can be consumers or observers or so that we can experience someone else's production. We worship, connect, and serve together on mission as ministers. I look out on this room and I know a lot of you have some titles in front of your names or some credentials that you've achieved over the course of your life. Many of them you're extraordinarily proud of. I want to give you a new one, a more important one, one that will have life-changing impact on all those around you. You are a minister. And this is what... Our mission is together at Covenant to build a community connecting in Christ. That's what connecting looks like. That is what connecting looks like. Us connecting first to God and experiencing God's grace alive in our lives. And then us carrying forth that connecting work of reconciliation out into the world. So that we're connecting the good news to those around us. That is our work. That's our mission. That's what God has set us to. And that is what is going to have the transforming effect on all those around us. May God do that work in you and me. May our perspective be drastically changed so that we can move from death to life individually and corporately in community together. That is our mission. May it be so in us. Let's pray. Gracious God, we pray that, that you would uh, just infuse your life in us, that we would receive life 
through the grace we have in Jesus Christ, and that you would breathe the wind of your spirit through every corner, that, that every, every cobweb that has been built up, every uh, layer of darkness that, that has he- hid in shadow, Lord, we pray for your light to shine and for us to experience a fresh wind. Lord, we are reconciled and made new. New creations on a new mission as ministers of the gospel. Lord, use us, we pray. Bring us off of the sidelines and put us in the game. For we know we go with you, and with you all things are possible. So we don't go in fear, but we go with joy, excited about what you have for us. Lord, use us, we pray. By the power of your spirit and in Jesus' name, amen.